Hello there! If you are following the world of professional cycling, you most likely noticed that the Aqua Blue team, sponsored by 3T, has essentially dissolved, and the entire thing happened in an atmosphere of a scandal. Many reasons were cited as uh, the key reasons why the team dissolved, but essentially it seems to be mostly caused by incompetence of the management. However, if you were following what the now ex-team members were saying, they also cited that the one by drive team they were using and were supposed to spearhead in the world professional cycling was one of the reasons why the team essentially failed. So that made me wonder, is it even possible to have a one by drive team on the road, especially in the world of racing where every second counts? Now that's something I would like to answer in this short video. On the mountain side of things, one by drive trains are the norm now. And that shouldn't be a surprise because they were making their way into that world for at least a decade even way before XX1 drivetrain was introduced. Back then it would be normal for a gravity oriented bicycles, so downhill and freeride, and enduro as we would call it now, to sport a 1x9 drivetrain, because 10 speed wasn't a thing yet as well, but it would usually have a form of a chain device and a standard 9 speed derailleur and 9 speed cassette. And the rest of course is history. Uh, XX1 was introduced, the mammoth cassettes now are the norm and 1150 seems to be the new sweet spot for the side of the cassette, or 1146 or 1150. So, why don't we have one by drive trains on the road? Because, well, all the benefits that the mountain bikers see seem to be on the road drivetrain as well, so what gives? Well, here's the thing. On a mountain bike you don't really need uh, loads of gears, you just need to have 6, 7 or 8 which are distinct and cover the entire range you're going to be using, so you need a few gears to go up, you need a few gears to go down and maybe you need a few gears to ride something in the between, but you don't really need to carefully control your cadence or how fast you're spinning. Now on the road bike, that's another issue. If you take a look at a classic road bike, and by classic I mean something that was from the era of 8 or 9 speed or earlier, you will notice that the cassettes on those bikes are really tiny. And by tiny I mean they have uh, 8 or 9 or 7 cogs, but uh, the smallest cog is 12 and the largest cog is something in the mid 20s, so 23, 25, and the reason for that essentially boils to one thing, and that is aerodynamics. Principally, road bikes are meant to be ridden fast, and by fast I mean something in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 miles per hour, or 30 to 35, 40 kilometers per hour. At such rate of speed, the majority of drag experienced by the rider comes from pushing away air, which is, simply put, aerodynamic drag. The thing about aerodynamic drag is that its relationship to speed is quadratic. Essentially, if you double the speed uh, at which the cyclist is moving, the amount of aerodynamic drag experience quadruples. The third part of this particular puzzle is called cadence, and it is a rate at which you turn in the pedals. The thing about cadence is that we, as humans, produce maximum amount of power at a fairly narrow range of cadences. So, in order to go fast, because you want to obviously ride your bicycle fast, because it's a road bike which is principally ridden fast, you need to keep your cadence at that range. Ok then, so what of it? Well, since principally you want to ride fast, and as I said before it's going to be something between 20 and okay, 30 miles per hour, or 30 to 45 kilometers per hour, you are going to be riding in a fairly narrow range of speeds. However, within that range of speeds, you are going to experience quite a varying levels of aerodynamic drag, because its relationship to speed isn't linear. So, in order to counteract this drag, you want to push maximum amount of effort. In order to push maximum amount of effort, you want to keep the, your cadence in a very narrow range. And that essentially tells you that within the range of speeds you are going to spend the most of your time riding, you want to have as many gears as humanly possible. And this is why road cyclists are so reluctant to let go of those uh, tiny tiny cassettes with loads of gears that vary very little. In the age of 5 or 6 speed freewheels, you essentially always had the choice to have the range but never the precision of gear selection, or you had the precision of the gear selection, but never had the range. 
it is actually very recent when we could simply brute force our way into range with a single gear by simply slapping 11 or 12 speed cassette on the bike. Even with a 9 or 10 speed drivetrain you still had to make the trade off and essentially it's always a workaround to having enough range on a road bike or a mountain bike previously without sacrificing precision of gear selection. Having 1132 cassette on a road bike is something unthinkable from the perspective of someone who lived 15 years ago and rode bikes 15 years ago. However, now it's a thing because with 11 speed drivetrain we simply have enough cogs on the cassette to get both range and precision of gear selection. A very usable road drivetrain has about 350% of gearing range. That's roughly an equivalent of 53 by 39 chain rings coupled to an 1128 cassette. However, now you can get that off the shelf without any problem on a single chain ring by using an 1136 cassette or, if you are brave enough, an 1140. So, if that's possible, the only problem you now need to solve is how to get the precise selection of gears needed for general road riding. The video you've been watching for the last couple of minutes is what I optimistically call my road bike. I've been experimenting with a one by drivetrain on a road bike ever since I saw the 13 speed drivetrain from Rotor, because that got me intrigued and I wanted to check some theories I've got. I tried 1128 cassette, 1132 and 1136, all in 11 and 10 speed uh, varieties and uh, I coupled them all to a 44 tooth chainring on the front. I thought that's going to nicely map to the typical range I am using, so that's what I did. When I used an 1128 10 speed, it quickly became apparent that there isn't enough range for all the riding I'm doing. I can get by most of the time, however when I get to a climb which is longer than, I don't know, two, three, four hundred meters, I quickly run out of gears. That also taught me that uh, all the road racers who rode all those massive chain rings at a tiny tiny cassette were really tougher men than I am. Next I tried 10 speed 1132 cassette and that proved to be usable but very annoying because Shimano for some unknown reason decided to make most of the cogs on this cassette spaced by two teeth. For general road riding that proved to be less than optimal, let's just say. My next attempt was with an 1136 cassette in 10 speed format, straight off a mountain bike. That worked well because it gave me all the range I need. However, that was not optimal because uh, all cogs on that cassette are spaced by two teeth or more. Especially annoying was the jump from 11 to 13 because it completely destroyed my cadence. Entire cassette is spaced similarly to the 1132, with the only difference being that the 32 cassette had at least two cogs spaced by one tooth. So whatever made the 1132 bad made the 1136 even worse. So lastly, I made a custom 1136 cassette in 11 speed format. I had the shifter, so I thought I just may use it. The only difference between this cassette and the 1136 from 10 speed is the fact that the smallest three cogs on the 11 speed format are spaced by one tooth. This solved the problem of the massive jump between 11 and 13. However, as you can see, it still makes me ride most of the time on the part of the cassette that is spaced by two teeth. And that essentially is the crux of the issue. The most commonly used gears are in the dead center of the cassette, which is what I want, which is what properly set up drivetrain should have. However, since there are only 11 cogs and I need to get all the 350% of range, I have only 4 or 5 cogs in the most commonly used range. So, all the gears I'm using the most are spaced by two teeth. And that obviously means that I can't manage my cadence as efficiently as I could if I had a proper road bike cassette. And that is a problem that manufacturers of equipment will have to solve in order to sell us one by drive trains on the road. Because in the current incarnation of this concept, the degradation of precision of gear selection is simply too great to make this a thing or make this sacrifice. So what can be done? I think that SRAM is onto something with the Wi-Fi cassette because they try to cram as many uh, high gears, so small cogs, 
on an otherwise uh, wide range cassette or wide range in the road meaning of the word. I also think that Roper with the 13 speed drivetrain have an excellent solution because all of their cassettes have four, five or even six cocks spaced by just one tooth because they have 13 cocks to play with. I personally call it a hyperbolic uh, sequencing of the cassette and the concept is that you want to put as many closely spaced cocks in the high gears and loosely spaced cocks in the low gears. And that's precisely what SRAM does with a white light cassette and to a much greater extent Rotor does on the 13 speed drivetrain. And if you take a look at the new Campagnolo 12 speed, the super record, you will notice that the 1132 option in that particular drivetrain is also hyperbolic. Although in their case I think it's much more to do with optimizing manufacturing rather than thinking about a selection of gears. Anyway, why would that work? works for the same reason why nobody is using a cord knob cassette these days, even though on 11 speed drivetrain it is fairly possible to have. works because we are much more tolerant towards cadence changes when riding on low gears than riding on high gears. So if you're on the cassette you're using, the high gears are spaced by one tooth, you are going to notice that it's very comfortable. However, if your uh, low gears are spaced by four or five or even six, if, uh, we're dealing with the biggest sets possible, then you're most likely barely going to notice it, or you're going to notice, but compensate for it very easily. And with that in mind, we can very easily deduce that making a one by drive train in the road requires a cassette that's spaced or sequenced hyperbolically. It is fairly possible to make it on 11 speed with some trade-offs. On 12 speed it is much easier, as Campagnolo has already shown, and I'm fairly sure that quite a few people, especially on flat lots, are going to write those things on single chain rings. And on 13 speed it is very easy. On 14 speed it's simply an opportunity which you simply cannot miss. And if you don't know yet, with the current technology, without much problems, we can get even 15 speed drive trains. In closing, the entire thing boils down to two particular problems. One, how to get the range we need, and the other, how to get the precise selection of gears when we try the hardest to ride fast. In order to fix both of, both of those problems, we need a cassette that is sequenced hyperbolically, which means that it has more high gears than low gears, and high gears are spaced very closely, and low gears are spaced very sparsely. On 11 speed, this is quite possible but not optimal, however it is very possible to make on 13 speed and in 14 it just makes itself on its own. So considering the rate at which uh, the progress on the equipment side of things is going, I guess that in 5 to 10 years we'll see one by drive trains even on the ground tours. And with that in mind, thank you for your undivided attention and see you on the next one.